All right, so uh, we are live. I see that um, Patty Stiberski is looking for a spring market update. I think that the market update is that it is bananas. What do you think, Greg? Well, yeah, that's uh, that that's a huge topic. But I think the bottom line is we're we're in this uh, uh, un uh, crazy market of low inventory, uh, multiple yeah. offers. Um, over asking price, removing contingencies. Um, yeah, you know, we're doing. There's like been there's, there's been a lot of chatter. Real before we jump into what we're going to talk about today, um, which is going to be you know things that help basically keys to success in building a business. But there's been a lot of chatter on the Facebook page about people waiving inspections. Should we be doing that? Should we not be doing that? And I think that um, it's a really interesting question. But I think ultimately in an extremely competitive market that is out of our control, we, can, we cannot control how competitive the market is. Um, the velocity of the market is at an all time high. It's gonna get crazier as the summer goes on. Um, it's not really up to us whether or not we do or don't waive those, those types of con contingencies, is it? It's really, it's really a series of pros and cons to your clients and you're offering a roadmap, but it's really the client's decision whether or not they, they waive things or they waive in appraisals, waive inspections, right? Paul, our job, as I've always seen it, is not to make decisions for people. Our job is to educate them on all the possibilities. They make the final decision. Um, if they're going to make crazy decisions, I kind of like to have something in writing that I advise them against the crazy decision and they have chosen to go forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to uh, read, because it's people- kind of tough though. It's kind of tough to, in one mouth, and one, or one, one side of your mouth say, in order to win, you have to do X, Y, and Z, but I advise against it, so sign this document here. It's, well, a, it's an interesting spot you know to- it, 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 We have to present all sides. And um, it's, again, for our clients to be able to make the best decision, they need to hear all sides. Like you should have inspections, you should have, of a boundary survey. You should have all these things. However, in this market today, if you ask for them and you're competing against 10 or 15 or 20 offers, there's a very high chance you are not going to win. Right. So even though I'm advising you to do this, I'm also telling you, I mean, that's our job. We have to tell both sides, but let's move forward here real quickly. Yeah. We don't have much time. Um, you know, we talked about I think uh, our topic was the keys to building a better business. Um, to me, the most solid business that's created by a real estate agent today is one that is consistent, is reproducible, um, is um, uh, um, in generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, they are listing machines versus working with buyers. The reason is simple, buyers take more time. Buyers is not always a paycheck. A listing generally is less time and is a paycheck. So I wanted to focus on the listing lead generation side today. And when I think about, I created something way back 20 years ago called the four pillars of real estate. And when you think about what are these four pillars that undergird everything that we do to build a business, it kind of goes like this. You have to lead generate first. Then you have to incubate or to keep warm um, all these uh, leads that you are creating, moving the most uh, the high the high percentage ones to the forefront, but never letting go of the others. And then you have to transact or negotiate or process in all of those things are going to be key in you getting future business from these people. If you don't do a good job there, you are not going to get future business or referrals from those people if you don't process, transact, negotiate, explain. And then finally, you have the follow-up systems, which we all talk about with CRM plans and, and uh, staying in touch. How do we educate these people? How do we make sure that they know that you are the consummate professional that they need to, they can't do this without you. They know that you know more than anything because you are uh, a monster when it comes to knowing everything about the real estate industry. So um, when you think about that, you go, well, okay, so 
you've got to generate leads, guys. You can do, you can be a great follow-up person. You can be a great negotiator, great processor of a transaction. But if you don't lead generate, you'll never get a chance to employ those other things that you're talking about. So really, and we're also dealing in this low inventory market. Um, and, you know, we know that I, I've been asking uh, around a little bit, trying to come up with an idea um, to how to stir things up a little bit. And so here's the question. Why? What, what's, the, what's the hardest thing we've got going right now in real estate? The answer is simple. It's the low inventory. I can show you... Um, the low inventory, real quick, the low inventory is not just for buyers, right? The low inventory issue is also for sellers. As, you know, Tim Creech says, and other people that say, you know, most sellers are also buyers. Well, you're, you're hit. The, sellers are just selling. You're, you're one step ahead of me, Paul, but that's oh, all right. Sorry. Um, and so the first question then is, we've got the low inventory. And then the next question is, why? Well, most thinking agents who have dealt with this will say, well, yeah, I go talk with a seller. And what, what do the seller say? I don't want to list my home right now because I don't want to be homeless. And I don't want to be in a position where I've got to pay a ridiculous amount of money against a bunch of other people. And so why do I want to put my home? I'm comfortable. I, there's some things I'd like, but um, I don't want to find myself in that position. And so I think that as we go forward, um, we have to ask the next question and it's, well, how do you change that? And um, as I've been looking at this, I have found out that several of the associations allow you to put a home on the market and to say that this listing is contingent upon the seller being able to find suitable housing. So now, when you, oh, now, hold on, hold on. So I want you all to think about that. Right now, I can tell you right now that uh, Wimlar, GMAR, MOM, um, I think GCAR all allow you currently to do this. And I go, well, why isn't anybody doing this? And I'm saying, well, because most agents, I don't believe know, they can go out tonight to a seller and say, hey, you know what? Get this, I can list your home, put it on a market. We can get offers. We can get multiple offers. We're going to find out how much value you really have. And you can then negotiate with a buyer as to how long of a period you want to feel comfortable. Or you can just say, I'm not making any commitment unless I can find a home. And if the buyer wants to deal with that, they can. If they don't, they can move on. But think about what would happen if all the agents went out in the next week, talked with potential sellers and said, you can now put your home on the market without risk. You are not going to be homeless. And um, you only have to move if you can find what you want. That's a good idea. And so what that does, and, and this, this sort of can help address the issue that we're talking about where these sellers are going, I don't want to sell my house. Yeah, sure. I'll sell my house in 24 hours, which means I've got 30 days and 12 hours to go find a house. Right. Basically, what you're saying then is you can list the property with basically the buyers are going, okay, I can write an offer on this property, but I'm going to have to be patient with that seller while they figure out where they're going to go next. Now, that's not the case for every market though. Well, no. And that's what we're, so like right now I have, um, I'm working with the Grand Rapids Association Realtors right now to change it because right now in Grand Rapids, it says you have to name the specific house that the seller wants. You can't leave it open-ended, but I'm here to tell you, it's already open-ended in Wimlar, Mom, GMAR. And again, we're going to do some more calling here, but I'm just, giving you, I'm just giving you one idea now I want to move on to some other things here. So I'm just going to mention these things in rapid fire right now, Paul. Right. Um, and I'm assuming that all agents know this, but you know what happens when we assume. I, so I, I, do. I don't want to assume. I know what it makes out of you. Yeah. So anyway, so as I'm looking at this right now, I'm going, all right. So expired listings, although, you know, that's going to be less of them today because if it's a good house, everything's sold. But I would encourage you to go back and look for homes that didn't sell three to 12 months ago. Um, the reason being is that they probably have far more equity today than they had. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pot of gold 
at certain times if you get good at expired listings. Um, number two would be farming, although that's a little bit more long term. That's where you systematically approach where you create a system of calls, direct mail, emailing possible to a targeted area, confined area where you become the expert in that market. Door knocking and cold calling, uh, or what, what does Tim Creech call it? Uh, what did he uh, say that again? It was not, not cold calling. He called it uh, actively prospecting. Actively prospecting. Um, the next one is interesting. Circle prospecting is the term they use, Paul, but circle prospecting is nothing more than um, recent sales in an area where a home is sold. If you go looking around where any home is sold and you call into that area um, or write into that area or however you want to communicate to them and say, look, at there was tons of offers on this property. People want to be here um, if you're considering it. So circle prospecting, um, open houses, we're probably not there yet, but it may be just around the corner as the uh, number of vaccines goes up. Here's a new one I hadn't heard of, but adding valued owners without asking them is always a good idea. The unsolicited video CMA is simply recording a video of your screen using a tool such as BombBomb or Zoom as you go through the active pending and sold comparable homes and then end with the current value range for the owner's home. So simply providing a range of value. Uh, this is a range due to me. Um, uh, this is a range due to me not seeing the inside of your home for a while. If you are cur curious about what it would sell for today in today's market, let me know. I can give you that number after a quick five minute walkthrough of your home. Um, so um, for sale by owners, always been a big market. Orphaned neighborhoods. Um, this is where a new development has gone in. They're three to five years old. Um, you know, it's probably getting time where some of them are going to start moving. Um, past buyers, online seller leads. Obviously, there's been a ton of people that have been spending money on online leads. Um, I also wanted to add a couple others here that um, uh, we talk about. Um, one of our agents... Um, Paul, uh, talk a little bit about um, Jason Scheringa and what he did there um, a few years ago when he well, all of a sudden he woke up and business had kind of stopped and what he realized. Uh, we had had, I think we've talked about this before, but we had had this meeting, um, Jason and I, and I felt like things kind of slowed. And I think um, throughout the conversation, you know, we were talking about how he was actively engaging with his sphere. You know, he's, he's, he's a younger guy, so he, had a, he has a very social media you know kind of thing going on and uh he was uh, renovating a property and he was talking to his sphere about that renovation like hey what do you guys think between this stain what about these tile selections and it was like 50 comments and 25 comments and everyone was giving him their opinion on it and it just kept him top of mind and he realized that he had kind of slowed down and he got distracted by the work right we all get caught up in the busyness of our work we get caught up in doing contracts. We get caught up in doing photos. We get caught up in giving feedback. We get caught up in all the things that real estate brings that aren't lead generation. And this, the moral of the story was that if you take your eye off the ball, which is lead gen, which is very simply put, talking to people. Like when we talk about leads, those are also known as people. Okay. Leads are people. And so I think the gist of it is just, don't take your eye off the ball. You have to be communicating with people every day. Don't kid yourself when you're looking at a lot of paperwork and you're printing things off and you're doing research. That's wonderful, but that's not generating relationships and people leads, right? So Paul, so, you know, years ago, I would come home at the end of a week uh, of working and uh, my wife could say to me, so how's your week go? I said, oh, it went pretty good, you know, and she might say, well, then, uh, well, how many new people did you meet? And there was a pause because some weeks I didn't. And I thought I was busy because I was doing all these things. I was exhausted when I get home. But in the end, I realized I didn't talk to anybody new that was going to buy or sell a house. And as a real estate agent building a real estate business, how could I possibly get to the end of a week and the number one thing I was supposed to be doing was meeting new people to add to my database. 
to add to my, my, my sphere, how could I possibly say I was working productively that week if I did not meet anybody? So I'm gonna challenge all of you to look at the past few weeks, ask yourself, how many new people have you talked to that could buy or sell a house? You know what you used to say to me early on? You used to say, Paul, if, if every single day, one more person knows that you're a realtor in the business than, than yesterday, you're advancing your business, right? Yep. You use this analogy of the teacup. Yep. Every single thing goes into the teacup. And what happens when you put a bunch of stuff in the teacup? Eventually the teacup spills over. So like a couple of thoughts would be that these agents out there that have a lot of business, they're not just luckier than you. They may have been, they may have had a larger social network. They might be better at connecting with those sphere, that sphere than you, but they aren't luckier than you. They are, they have more opportunity than you. So lead generation, I think is, a, I think we should stop using the word lead generation because it makes it sound like this, like far off distant, scary thing. It's communicating and connecting with human beings who want to buy and sell a house. And so you need, your job should be every single day, like you're saying right now is talking to humans who may want to work in real estate or have an interest in real estate every single day. Um, but yeah, take, what's, what's the next one on your list here? Do you have anything uh, else? So the next thing is uh, we got the Ninja, which again is real simply um, in my home. Uh, what I picked up from Ninja is every morning you get up five days a week and you write three note cards out to people that you know. Just, you know, whatever, find a way to say something, but send out three note cards a day. Then make three phone calls a day to three people you know. And if you don't know what else to say, it's nothing more than hi, how you doing? Mm -hmm. You can use uh, that acronym FORD, F-O-R-D, which stands for ask about their family. Hey, how are things with your family? Next is O is occupation. So how's your work going? Uh, R is recreation. Um, you know, what are you doing for fun? And um, D is um, dreams. What are you hoping to do this summer? Um, you going any place, you going any trips, whatever. Um, so that's one. The other thing that the new term that I'm hearing more and more of here is off market um, conversations where agents are getting together. And this is where an example would be, um, I heard uh, Barry Capel talking about this earlier today that some of the agents are getting together at the Granville office, hanging out and in the discussion, it's like, hey, I've got this, I've got this. Somebody else says, I've got this, I've got this. And before you know it, none of these things are on the market right now. It's just conversations that are taking place. So-and-so doesn't wanna move because they don't have any place to go. So-and-so says, hey, I have this house. And they go, really? Well, that, that might work. Let's see if we could get this arranged for um, you know, a, a, a show and sell or whatever. And so why can't um, agents put their own uh, groups together in effect and get together and talk about what they have, what they're working on, and maybe come up with an off-market uh, scenario. Um, and because this is what's going on all over the place right now. If you look at the, if you look at the sales, and I want to I wanted dispel a myth. I had an agent call me up the other day and he said, hey, Greg, I heard sales are down 50% this year. I said, wow, where did you hear that? And uh, well, I, he said, I thought I saw that come across. And I said, well, let me give you some, some real numbers here. I'm looking at, I'm looking at Mishrick right here. So far through January and February, the two completed months, we are up, uh, it was up 10% uh, in January sales were, and yeah. sales were up 6% in February. Now I can tell you that uh, Grand Rapids was down a hair. Um, and you know, March is yet to come in, but, um, it looks to me right now that March is probably going to be similar to last year. So there is no down in the marketplace. We're doing exactly what we did. You know what I, think? I think what, where that misconception is coming in is you're, you're looking at the number of listings down 50%, right? Over year over year. So we are seeing listings down, but here's the thing about listings. Those, if you think about it, like that, that number takes like the average number of daily listings available throughout the month. But remember, they're like refreshing every other day. So just because it shows an average of 200 listings a day, 
they're coming and going so fast that we're turning them quicker. So we're actually selling more, but it looks like we have a lot less. Yeah. But I will tell you, here's an example today. Yep. I don't know about, um, I don't know about all the associations, but I can tell you in Grar um, that um, in 2021 right now, the active average listings on the market so far this year is about 550. Last year, it was 1159. Mm -hmm. The year before, it was 1697. Mm -hmm. In 15, it was 2636. And in 12, it was 3893. And But then you look at the number of sales, the sales, here's an example. Last year, sales were 12,992. 19, they were 12,932. 18, they were 12,556. 17, they were 12,943. Now that's homes sold. So you double that for size, right? Right. And, but it's within, it's within 400 sales. Right. For four in a row. So we're, and the, the number of sales is not dropping or going up drastically. It's staying okay. relatively constant. Yep. So Paul, I, 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 I want to move quickly. I've got a couple other things here that I want to talk about that are on my mind right now uh, that are taking place in the market. And one of them that I want all agents to be careful, cognizant that you cannot collude with other agents to not show a certain company or a certain individual's homes because you don't like the co-broke fee they are offering on the listing agreement. You cannot, you may not collude with other agents. What's an example? Well, um, there's an example. Some of the offering, some okay. of the offering a percentage over here. You don't like the percentage, you think it's low. So you're, you're saying that groups of people might be getting together saying, hey, let's all collectively ignore that realtor's listing. Exactly. And then secondly, the, in that same thing, you may not like the co-broke that's on there. Um, Don Phelan called Gail Anderson, our attorney uh, in Lansing, and she is advising us strongly not to ask for a higher commission. Um, there's, we've been told over the years that if you did not like the co-broke fee, you could appeal to the listing agent to ask for a higher split. Well, what we're hearing now is that, how is that beneficial to your buyer? If your buyer was aware that you were negotiating to get paid a higher fee. Before even showing them the property. Showing the house, or furthermore, avoiding to show that house. There's so many uh, red flags there. So I'm encouraging all of you that please show the home regardless of the co-broke fee um, and do not collude with other people to avoid showing a property. Um, this is antitrust. This is, a, uh, this is something that would get you in huge trouble. Number two, you could appeal. Number two, uh, um, I want to talk about delayed listings. Um, there's see, and again, it, it, there's a little bit of a variation from association to association, but you're, if you see the term delayed showings, I want you to keep one thing in mind. That does not mean that seller can't sell the house before you even get in a, into that home. A couple We're of days. There's so, a lot of delayed showings, right? Right. So what's happening is that you set, you think that you are an ethical, moral person and you see it. So you set the showing up for Saturday because that's when they say you can do it. On Thursday or Friday, you get a phone call from the listing agent saying, hey, I'm sorry, the home sold. And you go, what the heck? Now you got to go back and tell your buyer that the home that they were doing the right thing by waiting until Saturday to see it has been sold. And they're going to go, Greg, why didn't you, I mean, how come you didn't tell me that this could happen? Why didn't you explain this better to me, the process? Well, you know, what, I, go ahead. Okay. What I was going to say is, is I think that this is something that we have to be, you're basically, it's a very, very good reminder. 
people from other parts of the country are used to buying houses sight unseen. There are places in the world, like if you're in military and you're moving back from overseas or you're over in South Carolina or they're moving to California, these people are buying houses sight unseen all the time. It's not a new thing. So my point that I want to make to all the agents is remember that you're the pro. You're the one who should know more about this than anybody. And you have to take the time to explain these scenarios to your buyers. If you want your buyer to see you as a pro, a knowledgeable pro, when this happens, you need to say something along the lines of this. I am not here to put pressure on you to force you to buy a home that you've yet to see, pay more money than the asking price, but I feel compelled to tell you that this is going on. So we're going to set this showing up for Saturday, but I want you to know there is a very good possibility on this home. It will be sold before we even do this because there are people who are willing right now to buy this home sight unseen, pay cash, remove all contingencies, and they're willing to do it. We're not talking about, is this good? Is this bad? I'm just telling you what's going to happen. And for your sake, for your ability to keep that person as your client in the future going forward, believing that you are the consummate professional, you have to explain this to them. And also ask the, ask the listing agent point blank, say, hey, are your clients accepting offers before that uh, showing, before showings begin? It doesn't, and Paul, I understand that, but- you I'm just saying, because there, there, are, there are realtors that miss, there are realtors that do these delays and are doing them wrong. Right. I'm, what I'm here to tell you is that even though they write it down there, if you put a $50,000 over asking price in front of a seller who says they want to wait till Saturday, they're going to, they're going to sign the deal. I, on I, I agree. I'm just saying, ask the, ask more questions. Right. So the, the other thing, um, so we've got uh, delayed showings. Now, when you see delayed presentation, that is a totally different scenario. That means they are going to delay the presentations and that one is contractual and it's in the listing agreement. The agent that um, allows that home to be sold prior to that uh, delayed presentation can, will, can and most likely will be taken before pro standards. Now that won't help your buyer because the home is probably still gonna be sold, but um, you as an agent will have a problem if you write delayed presentation. Um, there's another thing that's going on that I want you all to be aware of, and we've had at least one situation. The National Association of Realtors passed a new rule in January, and it's part of the, it's the, one of the first times in, in decades that they have updated the code of ethics. What they have basically said was that in the past, associations could only go after an agent for things that they did in the course of their work. If it was outside, it was on your personal Facebook site, had nothing to do with a real estate transaction, the real, the real estate association could not go after you. However, today, if you get into a political argument and there are some slurs and epithets being used, you can be brought before a real estate association, you could lose your license, you could be fined substantially. Um, and so I'm warning all of you, do not engage um, in a political situation and attack um, any of the protected classes with slurs or epithets, no matter what you are thinking, you are subjecting yourself to a new code of ethics rule 10.5 that could cost you your ability to provide an income for your family. So, Paul? Uh, I, one question here from Julie um, Reisner is, um, hey, you know, with the, with the whole off-market, um, connecting people who are off-market with off-market buyers and off-market you know off -market sellers and buyers, uh, is there any um, issue with hypothetically not, not exposing that property to the market to get top dollar? Um, how do you know? How do you know you're giving your seller the best price if you're not exposing it to the marketplace? What's the best advice for how to navigate that? Well, 
until we get all the agents up and ready to go into this new world of putting listings on the market that are contingent upon the sellers finding suitable housing, um, I would always protect myself with, you know, you are aware that putting it on the open market could have brought more money. We all can, and Paul, we could put a, uh, I can have Don or Eric or whomever create a, a document. It's kind of like my, um, my pre-offer addendum where we have so many things that are done verbally and you could, you could tell a seller that, um, uh, you know, as an example, right now, we had a, we had a case this uh, last week where um, one of our agents had something stolen from a listing. Well, you know what? We're not 24 seven security systems, right? We're realtors who get an opportunity to go in and show a home. There's no proof that the people that showed the property or anything stole anything, but the sellers claiming it. Well, I've always said as a real, when I would go out to home, I would always say to the people, look, at, if you have valuables, things that are irreplaceable, you need to remove them from the home and then put it in writing so that it's there that you advise them of this. So Julie, um, on any of these things that you warn the people of these things, if you don't put it in writing and memorialize it, it's nothing but hearsay at that point, which I'm going to tell you if there's ever a court case, the consumer's always going to win if there's nothing in writing where you've warned them. So again, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, um, you need to know that this may not be the best avenue to um, get top dollar for your home because you've not exposed it to the 7,000 eight, uh, to 8,000 realtors in the Mishrick <coughs> plus Zillow plus realtor.com plus everything else. So, and if a seller says they, they're willing to sign that, I think that reduces your liability. This is what we always have to remember. Some people do things for more reasons than just money. Um, if somebody gets an offer that's over asking price and it eliminates all the risk it's cash and it closes quickly and it gives them 90 days of possession free. You know what? They're not sitting there typically and thinking, um, oh, I could have put it on the market and gotten another $5,000, but then I didn't get the rest of these things, right? So it was the unique circumstances of that moment that allowed it to go together. But again, if you're really um, concerned, then I would always advise agents to memorialize any advice that mm -hmm. you've the agent that it given the public right anything else no that's the uh last of the questions um it looks like every market's going to have its own sort of like way to handle this idea of uh delayed i guess the the, uh, the thing you were talking about getting sellers on the marketplace by saying hey we can <coughs> look for known we homes. will be we will be checking and posting every association that currently allows it i know for an example right now that grand rapids does not but we know that um, Wimlar, GMAR, MOM, uh, and I believe GCAR all allow it. I mean, if, we can, if we can find ways to shake that loose um, and we can convince sellers to list with the, the security of knowing they have time to find the next property, I mean, that, that could bring a nice influx of, uh, of listings. And if we did that, think about the connectivity factor uh, if 500 more homes went on the market today in all price ranges, all of a sudden the person that says, I don't have a home that I can move into, all of a sudden it just popped up because of this new idea mm -hmm. of putting these things out there. We need to reduce the fear of the sellers. And if we do that, I believe they will step forward. And if we promote it properly, I believe this could be big. And I think that... Um, I'm trying to move Grand Rapids along. They may wait until their uh, April uh, 8th meeting or whatever it is, the second Wednesday of the month. But um, we will also, we'll produce this. We'll give you more information in the coming days. But we think that this is a possible solution. And I, I just gonna give a shout out here to two people, Mike Hahn and Doug Hansen, who both 
uh, had um, reached out and, and basically said, why, why can't we do this? Why, why, why would we not be able to do this? And I started checking into it and discovering more things. And so I want to uh, thank those guys for reaching out, bringing it up and um, pushing it forward. So thanks. Yep. All right. I think that's it for now. And um, anything, any closing remarks here or should we, or should we call it? I'm ready to call it. All right. If you guys have any questions about what we talked about today, feel free to reach out. We want to um, want to help you guys. So if you're looking for ways to set up a listing where you can do just what Greg was describing to help your sellers lock up a house without the, without the fear of being homeless, um, reach out to one of us. We all want to help. So um, make it a good week, guys. Let's, know, let's get more homes on the market. Let's get more homes on the market. And leads are just people. All right, yeah. guys. See ya. Yeah.